Um, cool. What's up, everyone? Uh, welcome to yet another lecture. Oh man, it's a uh, <coughs> it's gonna be a good time. Today we're going into web servers 101, uh, kind of the backbone of um, really web development. But I'm gonna start off by just opening up some notes, and we're gonna jot some things down. Um, so I wanted to start with huge shout out to Julian. Julian, huge shout out to Julian who helped me finish a good chunk of my project. I don't think he intended to do it on purpose, but I I made like um I play cribbage sometimes with my girlfriend. I've never won a game. I've never won, never, not even a, not even once. Um, but I figured what I would do is I'm gonna start building like I've been building this like cribbage simulator. Um, so that we can play like either a simulator or like a game that we can play from the command line so that we can play remotely like while she's working while I'm working like we could just play together um, so I've made I've made um crib crib js you can download it you can go npm install crib uh, no uh, it's a uh, at nema boscarino slash crib to npm install my crib. Now, the thing about it was like I didn't want to go through the trouble of doing the calculator for the scores. Um, and then Julian so kindly built it. So I plugged it in, and now here is a a simulation of crib. See, like Sadie won 122 points, and then I run it again. Sadie just keeps winning. I think. What? Stop. There, I won. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, yeah, so <laughs> I just wanted to share, um, just just to share a silly project that I made um, is uh, Cribbage Simulator. Cool. So I don't like code. I don't know if you know that. I don't actually code. Um, I teach, but I don't work on any projects. I'm kidding. I work on stuff, but like this is the most exciting thing I've done in the past little while. So today's whole situation is week two, day two. Intro to servers. I'm going to make some notes. Notes. It is week two, day two. We'll make this thing big. And today is intro to servers, right? AKA Express 101. So, I'm going to start with like a little bit of, um. I just wanted to chat a little bit about the test that you had, right? How did the test go on, on Friday and on the weekend? Huh? Tremendous? <laughs> no, I know you said traumatic, right? <laughs> traumatic. That's fine. Right? It's a mock test. It's like, meh. It's supposed to, it's, it's honestly supposed to kind of beat you, right? Um, it's supposed to make you feel terrible. That's the whole point. So if, if that is what happened, then kudos to the curriculum team, right? <laughs> like... Yeah. So it's not it's not meant to be finished in an hour and a half, like at all. No, no, no. Neither of them. They're not meant to be finished in an hour and a half. It's just we're giving you some quiet time to work on it. Is the thing, right? It's just some quiet time. But you have like you had until Sunday to finish it. You can work on it whenever you want. But we schedule some like quiet time where like if you run into issues with the test environment like you know I guess Travis was there to help you out with that stuff right you know same with what's happening this Friday is like we put aside like three hours for you to work on it it's not like you have to finish it in the three hours huh yeah, yeah. so actually I think I'm doing it so I sit in front of you and I just kind of go for like three hours um you know just in case you run into any bugs in case you run into any issues or whatever Right? But it's not like you have to finish it in those three hours. Right? You you have until Sunday night to finish it. So I really don't want you to like stress out too much about that stuff. Right? If you don't get a hundred percent, you don't get a hundred percent. Whatever, right? Like just do your best. Right? It's like an assessment tool. We're just figuring out, you know, how can we better teach you the stuff. Right? If you feel like it's super hard, well then that's on us to figure out how we should teach you that stuff better. Right? Um all that to say, like, don't freak out about the test. 
at all, right? Especially since like the stuff that you were doing on in the test on Friday, it, it's it's kind of a little different from what you'd been doing earlier, like a little bit, right? Also, because like it's not necessarily web devy related, right? You you're gonna be doing the same test essentially this Friday, right? Same kind of format, same kind of questions, right? And it's just another another opportunity to do that stuff. Um, if you do want some time to kind of go over those questions together, right? What we can do is either make some time at the end of this lecture for that, or individually, you know, just come to me and be like, hey, I want to do like a little bit of review of these questions. What we can do is just set up like a little breakout situation and spend some time going over that stuff, right? Maybe we can do that today. Maybe we can do that tomorrow, right? But just let me know. Do you, would that be useful for people to like get together and go over some of the questions together? Cool. So maybe come grab me during the break, right, in today's lecture, or come grab me after lecture, and we'll figure out a time to do that. Cool. So yesterday, you learned about HTTP. So we're going to start today's lecture with a bit of like a review of yesterday's stuff. Um, first of all, yesterday's lecture was delivered by Travis. Um, Travis is a really good friend of mine. We went to university together, um, and yesterday was his first lecture. Uh, so I'm really excited for him. I hope he does more lectures, so I have to spend less time with you. No, uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I hope he does more lectures because I like seeing him talk about stuff, and he's taught me a lot of things. Um, actually, he's carried me through classes. Like he put me on his back um, through like some classes in computer science. So yeah, I owe him a lot. So, anyways, he did yesterday's lecture, and it was on HTTP. I'm gonna start off with a little little vocab. What does HTTP stand for? Hypertext Transfer Protocol, right? And there's a couple things in here that are really important to kind of unpack, right? So Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And we're going to work through this backwards. This is a protocol for transferring hypertext, right? It's a protocol for transferring hypertext. Now, hypertext Hypertext is things like HTML, right? Just special text, right? We're going to say it's not just text, it's hypertext. It's cool text, right? HTML is technically just normal text, but it encodes like images. It, it can encode audio and videos and links to other documents, right? HTML doesn't have to be read uh, top to bottom, left to right, right? There may be sections of the thing that float all over the place, right? So it's special text. It's not just text. It's hypertext. Hype. Um, the next thing here is transfer, right? So HTTP is going to allow us, right, or is going to aim to give us the ability to transfer hypertext between resources, right? So I'm, I see something I want. I ask for it, right? Hypertext is over there. I want it. I go, hey transfer that over to me right and then the last part here is protocol right and a protocol a protocol is something that people agree on right protocol is something we agree on so just to kind of frame this and I don't know you did this yesterday but just to frame this a little bit when you meet somebody for the first time for the very first time do you give them a hug, like just right off the bat, hello, and just hug them? Maybe not, right? In some cultures, maybe people, you know, shake hands, give each other a kiss on the, you know, each side of the cheek or whatever. Um, but there's some agreement, some kind of societal agreement for how those interactions should go, right? When you're talking to someone, when you're talking to someone, you like wait for the person to finish talking, and then you respond. You don't just like interrupt with something completely, you know, unrelated or whatever. Right? So there's all these like standards for communication that people have already agreed on, you know, in the community or in the society that they're in. You don't really think about them much, but there is a protocol for how we communicate. And the protocol is completely artificial. Like it's completely arbitrary, right? It's just something that's kind of arisen, you know, out of out of um out of interactions. Now, when it comes to networking or when it comes to like code right protocols have to be written 
a bunch of nerds get together up on a mountaintop somewhere in Europe, and they, you know, brew up. They look like these people. They look like, um, they look like these people here, the, the graybeards. <laughs> yeah. They're like, we have decided that, you know, <laughs> like, HTTP version 1 is going to be da 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 da, right? A bunch of people just kind of get together and they decide the stuff and then I just mods. I love Skyrim. Um, so these people get together and they say, hey, you know what? This is what HTTP is going to be. This is how we communicate. Right? Again, almost essentially completely arbitrary, right? But as long as people agree on it and write it down somewhere, right, then communication can happen. Right, communication can happen properly. So they get together and they write um, they write this little dude, the hypertext transfer protocol 1.1, and they'll write a big document saying this is what HTTP is, this is how it works. It's a request response protocol. A client sends a request to the server in the form of a request method. Like all this stuff is just written out. And if you wanted to, you could go find this document. Maybe I'll put it in the notes. Um, you go find this document and like read it, right? And fully understand HTTP and understand the whole motivation behind it and understand why it exists and how it works, right? Or you can come take boot camp, learn it in a day, and then you just kind of move on with your life. Um, now, the way that this protocol here, HTTP, has been structured, right, is that HTTP makes a request right you make a request and then you get an http response right there's going to be a client and there's going to be a server the client makes a request the server sends a response there's a life cycle to how http works right which once you clue into it is very easy to track right somebody needs to ask for something and then they receive something back right so we're going to go through um a couple questions, and then I'm going to talk about HTTP a little bit more, and then we're going to dive into server stuff. So, first question here is, HTTP is a blank, 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 dash based protocol. It's a blank, 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 based protocol. And I'm going to put er over here. What does the blank stand for? Request, that's a, that's a good one. Let's do res. Uh, let's go Rezo. Hmm? I don't know if Travis used this word yesterday, so it's like it's unfair for me to do this. It's a resource-based protocol. Right? Did Travis use that word yesterday? No? So HTTP is a protocol that's built around requesting resources. Right? HTTP, you make a request for something. And then the response, you know, contains the thing, right, the resource that you asked for, uh, or a message, right, saying, I, you can't get that thing, right? HTTP is a resource, resource-based protocol, right? And what resource is going to mean for us is that I want you to get away, uh, get away from the idea of requesting a web page, right? I want you to get away from thinking about, oh, I'm making a request for this page, right? But rather making a request for a thing, right? We are asking asking for a resource. Maybe that resource is a page, right? Maybe that resource is something else. Right? And that's what we're going to explore a little bit. Is there's something that we want to get and we make requests for it, or there's something that we want to change and we make requests to change that thing. But we're always talking about a resource. Now, does this idea kind of make sense to people? Right? That's, that's the idea behind the protocol is when you make the requests, the philosophy, the mentality that you have to have is that I am asking for a thing, right? a particular object that exists somewhere. Right? Now, HTTP is a... Stateless, stateless protocol, stateless protocol. Now, what does stateless mean? <laughs> sure, there's no state. 
Mm -hmm. There's no connection between, uh, you know, the first and oops, and second request, uh, etc. Right? There's no connection between the second and the third request, or the third and the fourth. Right? Every request is just a brand new request, and what this means is that the server, which we're going to be dealing with right now, uh, or like in today's lecture, the server is not going to remember who it's talking to. Right? This is kind of like if every time somebody sent you a text message, it all just came into one long thread where everybody's text messages were, right? And they had to sign their text messages and be like, hey, uh, this is Nima. It's your boy, right? Like just signing every one of the messages, right? So that when you're, re you're the one receiving the messages, you have to read them and identify who it is, right? You won't immediately know. And okay? stateless is going to mean also that like I won't be able to necessarily scroll through the conversation. So if um if someone's like, hey, can you go to Nando's? And I'm like, yeah, I'll go to Nando's. And then they send me another message saying, hey, can you get chicken? I'm like, get chicken from where? Right? They'll have to say it all in one sentence. Like, hey, can you get chicken from Nando's? Right? So these commands. They'll have to be squished either into one situation or we're going to have to figure out ways to introduce statefulness right, into our communication. But by default, by default, HTTP is stateless, it is a stateless protocol. And what this is going to mean for us is that everything that the server needs right, should be sent with the request. Right? Now, HTTP is again this request response right so i want to spend some time on this because there's always a little bit of confusion right with http there is a client and a server right the client is the one asking for things and the server was the one that's responsible for serving up responses and what's important is that the server can never ever ever right send something to the client without being asked to, right? The, the way I explain HTTP is, imagine there's two buildings next to each other, right? And there's two windows. And in one of the, like, w one of the buildings, there's a person with a stack of papers and a pencil. And in the other building, there's somebody with just a pencil. The person in the building with the paper can make little paper airplanes, write messages on them, and then send them across. And the person on the other side, right, the person on the other side receives the paper airplanes, writes stuff on them, and sends them back, right? The person on the other side, like, the one that doesn't have the paper can only send data if they receive a request first, right? So they have to receive the request, do something, and then send it back as a response. Now, that's going to be incredibly important for us in the way that we kind of envision what's going on as we build up um, what we call the back end. So HTTP has this client and a server. Client sends a request, right? What kind of requests can a client make in HTTP? So you learned about verbs, right? So get, what other ones? Post, delete, what's that? So it put, so put for updating. Right? Get, post, delete, put, there's also a patch, which I've never actually used, so I'm just going to get, post, delete, and put are going to be our verbs, and then they're not just verbs, because a get request, uh, sorry, uh, uh, a HTTP request is made up of a verb, and it's also made up of a path, right, to which that request is being made, right? So I might go get slash dogs. Right, that's what we're going to look at today. What you were doing yesterday with the GitHub API downloader was you were making get requests to uh, slash API slash uh, contributors, whatever, right? You're making a request to some path with some verb, right? Now, there is also optionally, optionally there's data, right? Meaning that I might be making a post request, right? If I'm making a post, 
if I'm making a post request, I need to say, for example, create a new, uh, so this would be post to dogs, maybe. Create a new dog that has the name, uh, spot, and the breed, uh, German Shepherd. All right, this isn't real code, I'm just kind of writing this down. So, the request is made up of two things at least, and then optionally a third. Right. The verb, the path, and then data. The response, the response that we get back right, is built up of the server looking through the request, doing something, and then sending back something relevant. Right. What parts are there to an HTTP response? Right, so there may be header, and then body. What's that? Nope. There's the code. The status code is the most important part, right? Oh, I, I didn't write up here, but there's also like optional headers for the request. There's headers on the way as a request, and there's also headers on the way back as a response. We're going to look at body and status code are the most important parts of the response. Because the status code might be something like, what What would the status code maybe be? 404, what did you say? 200, right? 300, it might be 500, it might be 401, right? There's all these different numbers that all have different meanings, right? There's this really cool website called um, HTTP Cats, I think. Yeah, HTTP status cats. So you can learn about what the different statuses mean. So what does 100 mean? 100 means continue. And there's a cat just kind of floating. Um, and then you're like, oh, what does 404 mean? Not found. All right. And it's a good way to just kind of learn uh, the HTTP codes. 411, length required, apparently. Um, my favorite is 418. So 418 is I'm a teapot, and that's not a joke. <laughs> like, if you look up 418 on the MDN, the Mozilla Developer Network, the 418 status code stands for I I'm a teapot. Uh, the HTTP 418 client error response indicates that the server refuses to brew coffee because it is a teapot. Um, it's, <laughs> it's like an April Fool's from 1998 um, where... You know, if you have like a networked coffee pot, you want to send a requi request to to ask it to make tea, it would reply back with 418 because it can't. It's a coffee pot. It can't make a teapot. I mean, it can't make tea. No, got it backwards. It's a teapot. It can't make coffee. That's what it is. Um, so there's all these status codes. The status code is incredibly important, though, right? Because the server, as we're going to see, we're going to hop into playing around with this stuff. The server is going to look at the status code. Sorry, sorry. The server is going to look at the content coming in and set a status code, right? Set a status code is like a stamp of what happened, right? And the client, when it gets a response back, it'll look at the status code to decide what to do, right? It'll also get data and whatever, but the status code is incredibly important for the client to decide what to do. That's why when I go to, you know, github.com slash something that doesn't exist, I get back a 404, right? Because the client, being my browser, got a response back from the server saying, hey, that page was not found. Okay? And the client can just immediately look at the status code and decide, hey, I'm going to show this page instead. Okay? Now, here, we're going to talk about what backend means. Right? So, Yesterday, you worked on the GitHub uh, like API project, right? Did you have a good time with that? It's a what? It's a, it is a bit long. Do you have something to say? <laughs> Depending on definition, good. It's like just some good fun. Some good, wholesome family fun. Just get the crew together. <laughs> Who needs Scrabble when you can do the GitHub downloader project. Um, so the GitHub API downloader, what you're doing 
what you are doing is making HTTP requests, right? You're the client. You're making HTTP requests out into the void, right? Making HTTP requests out to um, a essentially a black box, right? Black box for us is going to mean just this void that you throw stuff into and stuff comes out. You don't really know what's happening in there, right? So in, in programming, when we say black box, that's what it means. It's like a function that you don't understand. You just know how to use it, and you know how to use the stuff that comes out, but on the internals, they're like, I have no idea. Right? So to this black box or you know magic, um, we sent requests and stuff came back. But today, today we open up that box. Right? <laughs> so today we open up that box, right? Today we become back-end developers, right? The back-end is the side that receives those requests, processes them, and sends something out, right? So this whole thing, this is back-end development. So when people talk about front-end, they mean on the client side, they mean on the browser, they mean everything that you see with your eyeballs, right? The back-end is everything that's happening on a computer somewhere else. Now, let's uh, let's start by doing a little bit of a little bit of back end work. I'm going to go ahead, and what I'm going to do is make a new folder. Um, so CD, nope, uh, nope. Cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make myself a new folder where I'm going to work on a little project. So McDur. We're going to do uh, node uh, server, just node server. So I've made a folder called node server. I'm going to CD into it. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to npm init dash y. Right. I always npm init dash y because that will initialize like an npm project, a node project. When I ls, I see now there's a package JSON in there. They just got generated. Does anybody know what the dash y on npm init does? <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> npm dash y is going to mean just say yes to everything. So it'll make the default package JSON. Because right? if I go npm init, it'll ask me the whole like questions and all that. What do you want your package name to be called? Uh, what do you want your version to be? I'm like, nah, man. npm init dash y just says say yes to all those questions. So I've done that, and then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make a file. I'm going to make a file. I'm going to call this one server.js. Now, I want to stress everything that I'm doing in this first half of lecture right, is for purely demonstrative, 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 demo purposes. Right? The code that I'm writing, right, I'm going to be using a tool that you're not going to be using. Right? I'm using a tool to show you the internals of how a server works. Right, I'm like I'm using really basic tools to build a server, but what you're going to be using in your assignments is using like a better, bigger tool, right? That we're going to look at in the second half of lecture, right? So don't stress out too much about the code that I'm writing right now, right? Until the break because it's not code that you're going to have to write. Right? It's just conceptually I want you to understand what's going on. So I've made this file called touch server JS. If I was to look at it, um here in node server wham beautiful there's nothing here this is amazing what a great clean slate for me to start off with I'm gonna keep both of these things next to each other and zoop okay so the idea here right now is like I might be able to run node server dot js and I get nothing back and that's totally fine right now I'm going to write in like a whole bunch of code and we're going to talk about it in a sec. You know, var HTTP equals require HTTP. You've done something similar, right? You did something similar yesterday. You went HTTPS instead, correct? Right? I'm doing HTTP. Virtually no difference, right? Very similar library, except this one is not secure. Um, as opposed to HTTPS, which is HTTP secure. And if I wanted to, I could console log what this is. Console log HTTP. And I'd see that it's some 
gigantic object, this huge object with all these things, uh, status codes, right? Like this is an object and it's got all these properties. I encourage you to console log this stuff once in a while and just see what you're dealing with. I start noticing things in here. What do I what do I see? It's our friend. I'm a teapot, right? So this stuff here, these status codes, they're built into the HTTP module, right? They're in there for reference. Next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to see that HTTP HTTP, actually, in fact, if I was to go dot status codes and just console log that part, I would just get the status codes out, right? Just the status codes. There happens to be a function in here, uh, whoops, a function in here called uh, create server, right? There is a function called create server in that big object, right? It's in there, and I can use it. I can go var server equals HTTP dot uh, create server. Because it is a function. So I could do this. Now, the create server function, if you were to look into the docs, right, and that's where you're going to learn this stuff, is you need to look into the documentation. Um, the way this function works is that it's supposed to take a thing. What is this? What did I just write? Hmm? Wrote an anonymous function. What does it mean when I put an anonymous function in here like this? What have I done? It's a callback, right? That's the word that I use. I say I've passed this function here as a callback to create server, right? So HTTP create server, right? And I know this feels like I'm pulling it out of thin air, but this is like in the documentation. Like whoever made this function wrote down somewhere that this is how you use it. Right? You have to pass it a request and a response. Right? So create server is going to require you to give it a callback function that takes a request and a response. And then what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to console.log request. That's all I'm going to do. Right? In here, when this anonymous function gets called, right, on a request and a response, it's going to console log request. And then the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, server, listen. And then I'm going to write something else in here. I'm going to write uh, 8080 and function. And I've passed another callback here. Yeah, console.log listening on 8080. Right, just some console log. I'm going to run this and we're going to talk about what's happening. So, what do you immediately notice has happened? I ran node server, then it says listening on 8080, and then what does it do? What is interesting about this program as opposed to some of the other programs that we've worked with? It just waits. Yeah, it doesn't return. It just stops. It's just there. I'm not back in my terminal. I can't, I can't ls. I can't cd. I can't do anything. Right? The program's just waiting. Right? Because I've told the server to listen. And once it starts listening, it keeps listening. Now, a program on our machine can listen on a particular part of like your network card, right? It can listen through what we're going to call a port, right? It's going to listen through like a little window that other things can talk through, right? I'm listening on the port 8080, right? Listening on port 8080, and what that means is that you can go to HTTP localhost 8080 and talk to this program, right? I can make requests maybe to this thing over here, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Chrome. 
I'm going to go up to HTTP localhost and then colon 8080, right? And the colon is going to mean port. And what do you notice is happening right now? The page just keeps spinning, right? It doesn't move, right? If I went to a port that maybe I wasn't listening on, like 8081, I immediately get back a response that says, hey, the site can't be reached. So by the scientific method, right, I know that when I go to 8080, since I'm not getting that response back, right, it means apparently I have reached the site. I'm just not getting a response. And if I look at what my code is saying, create server, I'll tell you that this callback here, this callback is what gets run every time somebody makes a request to my server. Every time somebody talks to it, it'll run this code that says console log the request. But it doesn't say anything like send a response. I haven't written that yet. If I was to look at my terminal, Right? I've got a bunch of stuff being console logged here. A bunch of stuff being console logged, and that is the request that I said to log. And I could dig through this request and I could find information. You could find information like the uh, s kind of machine that it came from or whatever, user, agent, what language is the browser in, um, uh, what else could I find? These are all the headers, right? All the request headers are in there. Right? And I could also maybe dig in and find other information. Ultimately, there's one thing in here that's actually really interesting. Um, and since the object is so big, it's kind of really hard to find. Oh, there we go. URL and method. Right, I have access to seeing the URL and the method that that request was made with. Right? So I could say, hey, console log request dot, dot URL. And I could also say console log request dot method and just see the URL and the method. Now, every time I make a change to this file, I need to go ahead and stop my server with control C and then restart it. You're going to learn about a tool tomorrow that's going to do that for you automatically. But right now, I want you to, every time you make a change, stop and start. Now it's listening on port 8080 again. I go ahead and make this request by refreshing. So I just refresh the page. And what I'm seeing is that every time I hit refresh, it printed out slash get. Because that was the request that I was making. Right? I can edit my request. I can make a request to slash dogs. Right? So I sent a request, a get request to slash dogs. And when I look at the thing over here, I got slash dogs get. I can get even funkier. I could po open up Postman. I could open up Postman and start doing funky posts and deletes and all sorts of stuff from there. Right? Did Travis show you Postman yesterday? It's awesome. Do you like curl better or Postman? Postman. Did I hear somebody say curl? <laughs> That's edgy. Um, right? So I could go to Postman and make, for example, a post to localhost 8080 slash uh, cats, right? So I sent the request. See, it's sending. And now when I go here, I see cats post. Beautiful. I can start writing code right, to do different things depending on the, on the requests, right? Now, the first thing that I might want to do is every time I get a request, I might want to send back a response, right? Right. I can send back <laughs> I can send back a response at the moment with response dot end. Right. I'm gonna restart my server. I'm gonna go ahead and make a request. And now I got haha a well now. Right. <laughs> I got stuff back. Now, this is interesting because anytime I make a request to anything, I'm gonna end up getting haha a lamal whether I make it as a get request or whether I make it as this post request here, send I got haha a lamal. We've established 
communication, right? So Postman here, or my browser, right? These are the clients. And this file here that I've written, this stuff here, this is the server, right? It listens for requests. When they come in, it might do something with them. And then eventually, it's going to have to send back a response. And here, I'm sending back a response. Haha, A, L, now. Now, I did not put in a status code, but that's something that I could do. Right? And I didn't put in data, but that's something that I could do as well. So if I went response.status code, I could give this a number. Right? I could give this a number like uh, 418 for example. And now whenever a request is made, if I restart my server here, whenever a request is made, which I'll use Postman for, what? I set the status code to 418, I'm a teapot. I did that. Right? You can set the status code to anything. Right? I, could, I could go ahead and set the status code to, you know, 404 not found or 365 whatever that is I have no idea right? notice that when I set it to 418 I'm a teapot I'm not actually a teapot right I can set whatever code I want but if I wanted to follow the protocol I would send back a status code that made sense right a status code that's that's consistent with what's actually happening so here since my request went all right, like nothing went wrong, I might want to send back a 200 OK. Right? But this is up to me as the back-end developer. Right? It's up to me. Now, if you notice, like I'm able to see the request URL, I'm able to see the request method, these are values. So I could do things like if request.url is one thing else do this other thing right if request.url is equal to uh dogs then i want to send back maybe a status code of 200 and a response that says uh, i love dogs and otherwise maybe i want to send back a a status code of uh 404 that says um no only dogs right i might do that does this idea make sense here right i've set up essentially different paths for the different urls that might come in as requests and now when i restart my server i get some dynamic behavior because if i go to slash dogs i get i love dogs but if I go to cats, I get no, only dogs, <laughs> right? No, I've, I've made some dynamic kind of behavior here. This is awesome because this is going to be the basis of how your websites are going to work, right? If I go to Facebook right, or Wikipedia or whatever, if I went to Wikipedia, it would be silly if every time I went to the Lady Gaga page, right? It, like it just showed me Lady Gaga even when I'm like, no, I want to see Steve Martin be like, no, Lady Gaga only. This is LadyGaga.com. Um, right? We need our websites to have some like dynamic behavior to them. So this is what we're going to do. Now, I can do stuff based on the URL, but I might also do stuff based on the method. Right? If the request method is uh, get, then I might you know, status code 200, uh, getting dogs, right? And then I'll send back a, a little dog. And then I'm going to pick a different one. There you go. I just like that better. Um, you know, I might do that. And then else, any other method, like a post or a delete or any other method, might say something like, um, I'll, I'll just for now saying creating dog and do 201. I, I'll just say that any other method is going to be creating dog. And now, 
if I go restart my server, I get even more... What? <laughs> this looks like a dog, right? Um, I get even more like interesting functionality where when I make a get request, I get getting dogs. And when I make a post request, I get creating dogs. Right? And this is supremely interesting. Right? I'm making super kind of customized functionality here for how my server should interact with the requests that it gets to come up with different responses. You can write anything you want in here. This is JavaScript. I can write uh, console.log uh, so, and I could write like a for loop. Uh, for uh, var i equals zero, i is less than a thousand, ten, yeah, a thousand i plus plus. Um, console.log um, DJ caller. Um, so, I don't know. I got to come up with better ad libs. Um, so, like, I could do all kinds of stuff, restart the server, make requests to get dogs, right? And now when I check the server, like, it said so and brap a thousand times, right? That's a, a, absolutely a thing I can do. I can write any code that I want. Any code. Right? We're going to be writing useful code in here. Because the thing is, I don't want to just send back some text. I want to send back, for example, some pages, right? Or I want to send back some data, maybe. Now, you learned about headers yesterday when you were talking about HTTP. And the headers could be sent as like in the request, but the response also might come back with headers. I can, I can do things such as say response dot set headers. Then I can say, hey, set the header, um, set the header uh, best. Best instructor. No, uh, I was gonna go Nima, but I can't think of any any random header. Um, ice cream and uh, salted caramel. Right. Just some. There's no such thing as an ice cream header in HTTP. I'm making it. Right. So then the ice cream header to salted caramel, and what I'm gonna see now is. When I make a request to get get dogs in Postman, and I look in the headers, what? Ice cream, salted caramel. Headers are where you can slap any extra information, any nice little extra information. You just pack it there into the header if you wanted to. Right? But there's some headers that are particularly useful, such as, such as the content type content type is going to inform the client on what kind of data they're getting back so if I say the content type is you know text slash HTML what this is going to let me do is send back HTML if I was to restart my server now okay, I might not immediately see a difference other than now it's in a serif font Right? I'll redo that. If I get rid of this content type, that's what my thing looks like. It's in this like Comic Sansy situation. Right? If I restart the server with the set header on, right? Now all of a sudden it's in fancy mode. Right? And what that's gonna let me do is that in my code I can actually write I can actually write, you know, some some HTML. I'm gonna get rid of the dog because it's gonna break every time. I can actually write some HTML. So now, if I started my server and I go that it's an H1 that says getting dogs, right? I could write as much HTML as I wanted in here, getting dogs, and then a p tag that says a hey, uh, 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 I love dogs, right? Here's all this content, and every time I look at it on here, it's done as HTML. Now, 
it would be ridiculous for me to write all of my page stuff in here. That would be ridiculous, right? This thing is going to become monstrous and gigantic. So instead, what I would like to do is say something like send an HTML file. And the way that we'll have to do that is that I'll have to load in load the HTML file, right, and then send the HTML file. Right. Again, I want to stress that what I'm doing right now, I want you to see how much work I'm putting in just to get basic functionality working, right? Because what we're going to look at in the, like, second half of the lecture is that I'm going to do all of this in, like, two lines of code. Like, it's going to be super, super short. So load the HTML file. I'm going to need to load up the um, f file system thing, so require fs. So you used fs before, I think, for loading files or writing files. Then I'm going to need to say uh, var uh, dogs page equals fs.read uh, file sync. Uh, and I'm going to have to say, uh, I don't know, dogs.html. And then here I'm going to need to say something like, uh, well, we said res set header content type. And at the end of it, I'll have to say, instead of sending back HTML like this, send me back the dogs page. And then I'm going to need to actually have a dogs page, meaning I have to go in here, make a new file called uh, dogs page, uh, what did I call it? Dogs.html. Make myself a HTML document that says, um, dogs and uh, h1 oh man I love dogs uh, and then maybe a p tag uh, dogs are great just some content so that we can see it on the page but I have to have this page existing but the flow of what's going on in the server side is when you get a get request to dogs set the header for ice cream set the header for content type set the status code retrieve the dogs page and then send the dogs page so now when I save the server and restart, when I make a get request here, I get, oh man, I love dogs. Right? And what I can do is, you know, maybe go get a picture of a dog. Um, dog. I'm going to, you know, save this picture of the dog here in, where are we at? Server notes. Web server notes, node server, right? I could save this picture of a dog and I could even put it in the page and it should show up. Um, now when I go check the thing. Oh man. <laughs> uh, oh, actually this is, this is fine. Uh, the fact that it doesn't show up is my fault. Um, when I try to put in an image of a dog that's local, I haven't made a route. I haven't made a route in my server saying when you make a get request to dog.jpg what to do. And that's what happens when you put an image on an HTML page is that the browser then goes to make a get request for it. So this would work if I got an image from the internet instead. If I did, no, not the kennel, not, not the website. There we go. Open image in new tab. There we go. If I, if I just replace this, so ignore the, the mistake that I just made, because we're going to talk about that like tomorrow. But now I have this dog right here. Right? And I could build a billion pages. I could make all the pages I want. Right? I could make forms. I can make all kinds of stuff. And I could write my website in this way. But what I want you to see, what I want you to see is the tremendous horror that I had to go through to write this thing and how difficult it is to read this. Right? This is not easy to read. It's so confusing. You need to start from one place and like work your way through. If I put my mouse here, I need to work up and say, oh, this is a get request to dogs. Right. This is terrible. So I need some nicer way of doing this, especially when I'm trying to decide what content to send back. Here, this is me sending back some text HTML. But say that I wanted to send back some json right you worked with json yesterday correct you worked with json yesterday from the github api 
meaning that I should be able to send back JSON, and I can, I can. I can do things like, I can do things like say, maybe here instead of creating dog, I'm going to go uh, var new dog equals an object that says uh, name spot uh, breed uh, chihuahua, right? Here's new dog. And I might say response dot set header content type application JSON, right? Because that's the content type that tells the client that they're looking at JSON stuff. And then when I send the response back, I have to go JSON dot stringify new dog to take the new dog and make it a JSON string. I don't want you to necessarily understand what I'm doing right now, but I want you to see the work that I'm putting in, right? Just to say that I want to send back some JSON. Okay. If I made uh, any request now to this thing, such as, so with Postman, if I did a put, or sorry, post dogs, I get back now some JSON. Right? In the header is, I see, content type application JSON, right? but I had to put a lot of work into that. So we're going to end this first half here by saying, I wish that there was a better way for me to send back data. Right? Right, so after, after this whole situation, oh man, where am I? Wrong file. No, it's new. After this whole thing, uh, I wish there was a better way to send back data. And I wish there was a better way to declare these uh, routes, right? Routes being these particular th things of verb plus path, right? And there is. There is a better way. So are there any questions about what I've done so far? No? Cool. What we're going to do is we're going to take a 10-minute break at 10.12. We're going to continue, and we're going to look at a better tool for building this stuff. Sweet. Thanks, everyone.
Okay. So when we had kind of left off before the break, my question was, I wish there was a better way to send back data, and I wish there was a better way to declare these routes, right? these different kind of paths for things that can happen that are made up of a combination of verb and path. And I wish there was a better way. And the thing is, like, luckily, there is. Right? Things can be much better using using a particular tool called Express. So I have uh, an example. I, I have an example of that Node demo that I made, but I also have another example of that Express demo, um, which I'm going to have in the notes for you, but I'm going to make a completely new one. You know, Express uh, test. No, Express server. Okay. So uh, I will clean up the repo when I send it to you. But Express server right now has nothing in it. It's just this empty folder. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna make a new file in it called like server JS as well. And then I'm also. I'm also going to do npm init dash y in here. So right now I have a package JSON and a server JS. Right? And what I'm going to introduce you to, what I'm going to introduce you to is a thing called Express. Express being a framework for us that will let us build backends. It'll let us build servers with very little code. Right? And it'll have the effect of being very, very legible. If I go look up Express JS, you're gonna find that there's a web page for expressjs.com. Web application framework for Node.js. It's a fast, unopinionated, minimalist web framework for Node.js. Now, I'm going to really, really recommend taking a look at the getting started, taking a look at the guide a little bit. Right, work your way a little bit through the documentation so it doesn't feel like this, come, this stuff is coming out of thin air. Right, like it it can be really hard to like just watch somebody code, right, and be like, look, where does this stuff come from? But I'll tell you, everything I got is from these guides and from the getting started. Right, it's all in there. Now, Express is a web framework for Node.js that is fast, and it has when it says unopinionated. It means it's going to give you kind of the basic tools for what you need to do, and it's not going to impose its own kind of structure on you too much. Right? You can use Express in your project, and then you don't have to think about it too much. Right? You're going to understand what, un what unopinionated means a little bit more later on in the boot camp, but there are sometimes frameworks or libraries that you bring into your projects that really take over the project that you're building. So... Express, if I was to look at how to get started with it, I can start by, you know, what I just did, make a folder, CD into it, npm init, right? And then I'm going to need to install Express with npm because it's an npm package. So I can go ahead and say npm install Express. Now, you might notice that I write npm i instead of install. i is short for install. You might also notice that I didn't put on save, right? Dash dash save. Dash dash save was to write it to the package JSON. Nowadays, when you do npm install like this, it writes it to the package JSON on its own anyways. So you don't need to do the save. And in a second, what I'm gonna see is it goes, it grabs express from the web, and then it brings it into the package JSON so my package JSON now says dependencies express. And I'm going to start by writing a little bit of code here. I'm going to go var express equals require express. And then I just want to console.log what express is. No, not install. No, stop. I'm going to console log what Express is. So to run my thing, I can go node, server, and this was all of Express. Does it remind you of anything? Just big object. 
it's sort of like that cre like that HTTP module, right? It's just got a little bit less immediately visible stuff. You don't see the status codes in here, but they're hidden somewhere, right? So Express is going to be this module that we're going to use to create to create our server. Now, Express is good for these things. Express is great for routing. Express is great for this thing called middleware. Right? A word I haven't used before where we're going to explore. Right? Express is great for routing. Right? Setting up the routes, as we're going to see in a second, is going to be like, it's a sauce. It's so good. It's so nice. Right? It's beautiful. And then the middleware is going to make sense. So for right now, I'm just going to write in middleware uh, anything that happens or that we need to happen between the request and response. Right? We're going to explore what this idea means in a couple minutes. If I go to my express code though here, right, I'm going to write down some stuff that I pulled from the hello world like getting started documentation, right, which I want you to take a look at. But it goes var app equals express. And then it says var, you know, maybe put the port in a variable 8080 just like we did before. I'm just putting it in a variable this time. And then I'm going to say app.get And then Nima goes super silent because I want you to just think for a second. <gasps> what? What? It looks so similar to what we had before and yet so much better. Right? Maybe not immediately evident, but we're going to dig apart, like, like pull apart why this kind of looks better than or why I think it looks better than what it, we had before, which says, I am listening on, and then 8080. So, if we were to take a look at the code that we had before, right, anytime I want to declare a new route, I had to put it inside of these if conditions. Right? What I do with express is I say app.get slash. And this is me registering a route, which is get slash. Right? I've registered a route that says, hey, anytime somebody makes a get request to slash, this is the callback that you should run on the request and the response. Right? It seems similar to what we had before, this whole request response in the create server. But here, I get to isolate it just to get slash. Right? Instead of having uh, create server, you know, they just go express like that and put it inside a variable called app. Right? That's just a syntactic difference. But the importance here is the convention for how I'm declaring routes. You know, this function given a request and a response, console log the request. I'm going to start my server now. Right. You can see again, I'm listening on 8080. It waits because it's listening. App listen. And then if I was to go ahead and make a request somewhere, such as localhost 8080 slash, or you know, just nothing, this is again just like we saw before, hanging. And if I was to look at my terminal, I have now console logged the request that came in. Right, so this whole thing, this is the request that came in. And I still see things like URL, and I see still still see things like method. But I don't need I don't need to look at those things because I've got get slash over here. And I can make as many of these routes as I want. Now I'm going to just write one thing here. I'm gonna write res uh, sorry, response dot send um, home page. Right? Notice when I was working in the other thing, I wrote end. Right? When I'm working with express, I'll write send. 
send home page. And then I'm going to make another route here, app.get function request response. And I'm going to say response dot send docs. I'm just going to pull the console log out for a second. Now if I was to restart my server, if I was to make a request to 8080, I get home page. And if I make a request to slash dogs, I get dogs. Right? But what I want you to see is, look at how much nicer this is compared to the stuff that we had to write before. Right? Where now I am declaring, I am declaring these different routes. I'm saying, hey, when you make a get slash, this is what you do. When you make a get to dogs, this is what you do. Let me do a post. When you do a post to dogs, request response, uh, uh, response dot send, uh, creating dog. When you make a post to dogs, this is what you do. Right? Notice they're all on their separate kind of section here. Right? They're not bleeding into each other. It's just nice and they're all kind of kept apart. And every time I can look at the request and the response for that particular path. Right? That particular thing. Right? This is nice. Nicely kind of chunked out. I don't end up with this mess here. Right? Granted, the example that I built earlier has a bit more functionality, which we're going to implement bit by bit. Now, for today's situation, right? I am going to not work with post very much. Right? Tomorrow's lecture is all about post, right? It's all about CRUD actions. Um, your assignments are going to explore that stuff as well, and I want you to see that without me showing it to you first. I want you to play around with it. Um, what we're going to do is spend a bit of time in here. Now, each one of these things I'm going to call a route. Right? This is a route, creating new routes. And that's what I mean when I say that Express is really good for making routes because I can just declare them as these single new expressions that go app.get and then a pattern. When you make a get request to slash dogs. Now, I can change things up a little bit here. What you're going to see most of the time, when you look at documentation or when you look at you know your assignments, you're going to see things written out as REQ and RES. Right? Instead of request and response, they'll say rec and res. Right? Just to keep things short. Just be consistent. Right? But I want you to know that rec stands for request, res stands for response. I find that when you do REQ and RES, I tend to run into a lot of bugs when I'm starting on a project early on, because I'll get these two backwards. Right? So if it helps you, write them out as full, full words. Now, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is try to send back maybe some JSON. So for example, when I go get slash dogs, I want to see all of the dogs. Now, what I had to do before and let me just make a var dogs equals maybe some object that says uh, spot uh, has name spot and breed uh, chihuahua. And then anybody got a dog? What's your dog's name? Jujube? Jube? Oh, that's cute. Okay, so J J U J U B E. Um, so name, <laughs> Juju, and then what breed? Chewini. Ch <laughs> <Chewini>? <laughs> oh, Chewini. Chewini. I I thought like Houdini, like like a m magical dog. All right. So I've got some dogs here. When I was doing the responses before, I'd have to say application JSON for the content type or whatever. response.json. That's all I have to do. Right? Express is going to take away a lot of the work that you have to do. So when I go and I restart this, 
and I make a get request to dogs, I got back a JSON object of all the dogs. So we're going to be using Express to listen for these requests do some work like I just did, which was go grab the dogs, right? And then send back a response, right? Your application is uh, a thing that hosts a bunch of URLs, right? So you're going to have somewhere where the URLs are going to be stored and you'll do operations on that, right? And what you're going to see tomorrow in lecture is the kinds of operations you can have on that kind of data. Now, I can get a little funky here. Can get a little funky. So, say I wanted to get a particular dog. Function, you know, request, response. I could send back the particular dog. The way I've done that here, or the way I've started that is when I declare the path for that route, I put in a little parameter. Right? I went dog's colon name. And what colon name is saying is that this here is a placeholder. Anytime somebody makes a request to get slash dog slash spot, right? or get slash dogs slash uh, Cthulhu, right? just any kind of request, uh, get slash dogs slash whatever. This value here, that's going to be put in the placeholder name. And the way that I can access that, you know, console.log, I can access that in the request object. I can go request dot params, and I'm going to be able to see all of the parameters that were passed in. So let me not send anything back yet. So it's just going to hang. I'm going to restart the server. I'm going to see that when I make a request to dogs slash juju, this hangs right now, right? It's just hanging. That's fine. And the thing that I got printed out in the terminal are all of the parameters. What type of thing is this? It's an object, meaning the request params, this thing here is an object. And if I wanted to access one thing from it, such as the name, I could go request.params.name to access that thing. Right? Super, super, super important. This here is going to be put inside of the request.params object. Yes. Exactly. So the colon is a signal to express that that's going to be a variable, right? That's going to be a placeholder. If I didn't have the colon in there, then the route is dogs slash name, literally, right? This here makes it dogs slash something that we're going to call a name, right? So I can grab the name. I could go var dog name is that. And I could grab the dog by dog name because my dogs here is just an object of many dogs. And then I could response.json dog. And now I have made a super dynamic route where every time I ask for a particular dog, this is Juju and this here is Spot. I get back different data on the different paths that I made. Can you even imagine how we would do that in the other thing that we were looking at? Right? We'd have we'd need so much code to make that work. Right? We'd have to go split up the thing by slashes and find the particular one and then, you know, do stuff with it. This here, I've said, "Hey, treat name here as a placeholder." And I've generated technically an infinite number of routes, infinite number of routes for any possible combination of names. Right, infinite. Right. So this is why Express is awesome. Th like these routes, super, super, super powerful. Right. With very little work, I've been able to create 
a web page here that returns back, you know, different things for different docs. Now, I might also want to send back pages, right? I might want to send back an HTML page like we'd done before. So, I mean, something that I could try to do in here is maybe when I send, try to do a h1, haha, and then do a p tag that says, um, it, it's your yeah, boy. Right? Just a bunch of content as HTML, and I save and I go check out that page. Right? And it may or may not work. Oh, whoops. I wrote. I wrote response instead of res, my bad. So, res, res. And I should do that anywhere that I change that. So this should be REQ, RES, RES. Um, REQ, RES, RES. And I think that's it. So, I should be able to, you know, get some content back as HTML. That's cool, that's fine, but I, again, don't want to end up writing my entire page as a string here. I, I might want to put it in a file somewhere. Now, the thing about that is, then I need to go through all the work that we did before, which is load in the file and send it, right? for every single time that I make a new page, every new page that exists. Instead, instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use something called EJS. So this is a little bit of a departure from what we've been talking about, right? And I want you to just hold on for a minute. That's going to tie back. So one of the questions that I had here was, I wish there was a better way to send back data. Right? I want to be able to send back pages of you know content. I'm going to be able to send back pages of content. And one of those things, those pages, maybe to be dynamic, just like my JSON response was dynamic. So there is this thing called EJS, Embedded JavaScript Templating. Right? And we're going to use this as what I'm going to call a view engine for our server. When we do HTTP stuff, a lot of the time, the responses need to be HTML. Right? So for your project, for your tiny app project, you send a request. You want to get back an HTML page. And since that's such a common thing, right? Since it's such a common thing, we call it a view. It's like the view into the data that we're looking for. That's going to be the HTML. And that HTML needs to be constructed dynamically. Because sometimes that HTML should have a list of some some particular dogs. Right? Or maybe if I go to like Wikipedia and I go check on different Wikipedia pages. All these pages have the same structure. They have the same structure, but they have different content. So I might want to create a template for a page that gets filled in with the content that it needs. Right? This is just such a common thing that we have to do that there is an NPM module for it. So if I look up how EJS and Express are used together. Meh. Nope. EJS. I'm looking for a particular. There we go. Um, I'm going to give you this link in the notes. But the basic setup, we're going to see what EJS is exactly. But the basic setup is that we have to say the app needs to have as the view engine EJS. This is going to make sense in a minute. I'm going to need to npm install npm install EJS. While that's installing, I'm going to my server and I'm putting that line up here at the top that says set the view engine to EJS. Okay. And then there's a step here where basically I have to go ahead and make a, and this is this user steps that you're going to go over again tomorrow, 
but I have to have a folder called views. And in my views folder, I can have a file that I can give any name. I'm going to call right now, I'm going to call the file index.ejs, and it's just going to be blank. The important thing here is that index.ejs lives inside of views. And then the last thing I have to do is, instead of saying send, I can say render and the name of the file. Right, so it's those three steps, I guess, to put the thing at the top, right, set view engine EJS, uh, well, and install, make that index EJS file in a views folder, and then say res render. And what I'm going to see now is when I run my program and I go to slash, I get a blank page because that's what I said my index page should be. It should be blank. Notice a couple things. I didn't say index.ejs and I didn't say views slash index ejs. Node knows or express knows to go look into the views folder. It'll know to go there. Right? If I didn't have it in there or if I asked for something that wasn't in there what I'm going to get is an error that says I couldn't find that view in your views file. Right, so I'm going to need to make sure that the names match. The other thing that I can do now is start writing HTML here in this EJS file. Right, I could write all kinds of stuff in here. I'm going to write head, uh, head, and then body and buddy and I can write stuff in here like h1 um, welcome to my website now this is the view that is going to be sent when we say res render index notice that when you edit EJS you don't have to restart the server you do when you edit the JavaScript but not when you edit EJS so I can write anything whatever really. my awesome website and this is going to be cool for us because what's happening is we've created essentially like a pipeline we've created a pipeline between the request and the response the request comes in and then I've said here that when somebody calls render right when somebody calls render before you send the response create that response using EJS. And it's this thing that I've kind of snipped into the middle of that pipeline of request response, right? It's in between the beginning and the end. Which is why I said that Express is really good for middleware, right? Anything that needs to happen between the request and the response, you can bring in as little plugins, right? So what we've done here is we've essentially installed a plugin, right? to make the HTML generation right, quick and easy. Now, I wrote full-on HTML in here. I wrote full-on HTML, but this here, it's not HTML. It's .ejs, meaning we can do crazier stuff in here. I can do this, for example. So, when I do this and I go refresh the page, I got the number two. What? Where did the number two come from? I don't even, like, command F2. No results. Right? There's no two over here. Right? The one plus one was evaluated. It was evaluated and it was turned into the number two. Right? This here is not an HTML tag. It's an EJS tag. It starts off with angle bracket percent and then an equal sign 
and it ends off with percent angle bracket. The equal sign is going to say, hey, you can write a single, single line of JavaScript in here. You can write one line of JavaScript, and the output of that line, I'm going to print it to the screen. You can write a single line of JavaScript, and the output is going to be printed to the screen. So I could do all sorts of things here. I could go hello plus world, world, right? And now this thing here is going to show me hello world. There is another type of, I'm going to change this back to one plus two. Um, there's another type of EJS tag that you can have, which is percent with no equals. And in here, what I can do is I can write something like the beginning part of a for loop. i is less than 10. i plus plus. Right? I can write the beginning part of a for loop. And in here, now, you're going to find that the syntax highlighting gets really weird. In here, I can write content like... Where did you go? Where did the percent sign go? What's your intuition about what this might do? It'll print out "Hey yo" ten times. Right? I'm dynamically generating content here. I'm I, I've only written "Hey yo" here once, but this is not HTML. Right? What EJS is going to do is it's going to evaluate the stuff in here and construct the response and then send it out. Right? So if I go here and I go refresh, I end up getting heyo 10 times. So I'm able to write things like loops and stuff in here. You're going to do something very, very similar. Right? Why don't you just start thinking about the possibilities of what you might do in here. Here's another thing. I'm going to make an H2 that's going to print out message, right? But it's not a string. It's a variable. On this page here, I don't see the variable message anywhere. I'm not seeing it. If I tried to run this right now, I would get an error that says, hey, message is undefined. Excellent. Message is undefined. I can define message somewhere. Where I'm going to do that is write where I call render. I'm going to make a variable called template vars, right? Just a convention. You can call this anything, but people tend to call it template vars. This template vars is going to be an object. And to this object, I can pass message as a property and write something like uh, what up from express and then I can pass this object to the view so the index EJS page is going to receive those template variables that I just declared it's going to receive that stuff and if I go ahead and I restart my server now, because I changed the JavaScript, and I refresh this page, I get what up from Express. And this is awesome, because in the EJS file, in the EJS file, I don't see that. I just see message. This is going to be useful for us, because I want to make pages that might dynamically show content about the dog or pages that show all of the dogs. That's how I'm going to end this lesson today, is I'm going to make those two pages, and I'm going to talk really briefly about middleware a little bit more, and then I'll let you go. Before I do that, though, are there any questions? Is this making sense to people? Right? It's, it's OK if it's like a lot. Right? It's OK if it's a lot. I'm just tossing a bunch of stuff at you, and you're going to play with it. right? Conceptually, though, what's going on is that a request is coming in, I do something with it, and I send it back. 
there's plenty of time to get comfortable with the syntax. Now, I have a couple things in here. I have this dogs stuff. Maybe getting all of the dogs instead of JSON. What I might want to do is res.render like a dog page. Like a single dog page. Oh, sorry. Uh, dogs page. Like a all the dogs page. The template variables that might be useful for that might be maybe all of the dogs. All of the dogs. And then I might have to go ahead and actually create those p that page. So I've just kind of copied the page that I had before, dogs.ejs. And this one here might say, um, these are all the dogs. Right? I haven't written any code to loop through the dogs yet. I'm going to do that in a second. The other thing that I might do is when I'm looking at a particular dog, instead of JSON for that dog, I might go res.render that single dog page. And the template variables here might be var template vars dog is that dog. Now, again, I'm going to need a page for that. So I'd have to go here and go make a new page, dog.ejs. Um, this is one dog. I haven't done any of the template var stuff in here just yet. If I was to restart my server, I would see that when I go to slash dogs, I get that page. These are, these are all the dogs. And when I go to just slash dogs slash spot, I get this is one dog. Now what I'm going to do is in here, in the EJS, for the one dog, I could do things like an H2 that says name and embed dog.name in there. And I might do the same thing for breed. And now when I go look at this page, I get spot and chihuahua when I'm looking at spot. And if I go to jujube, I get jujube and chihuahua. Right. So I've used that EJS kind of plugin to create like a template for a page, right, that gets filled in with data when I need it to be filled in. Do you see how this is essentially identical to what Wikipedia is doing? It, you technically, at the end of today, have the ability to create something like a Wikipedia that you go read. Right? Like you, you genuinely have the ability to create something like that. Editing content, maybe not yet. Like you'll learn about that tomorrow. Right? But you have everything that you need to create this process here. Where every time I go to a different page, whoops. Every time I go to a different page, it shows me something else. Now, I kind of purposefully have not filled this part in yet. How do I show all the dogs? Right? I'm not going to do it. I just want you to think about it. How do I show all the dogs? So the dogs are passed in as that object. Right? So I'm going to need some way of looping through an object and then display each one of those things on the screen. Right? Do you know how to loop through an object yet? Hmm? Yeah. How, how do you loop through an object? You could use a for of for in. So for of is not going to work. For of is going to work for arrays. But for in, like you said, for in, perfect. Right? So you might want to experiment with um, in here 
Can I use for in? Right, maybe you can. So I, I kind of want to leave that as an experiment for you. Right? The notes I'm going to send out do have an example of how to do that, just in case you want to check. Now, here, what I've done is, again, I've, I've used EJS, which is essentially a plugin, right, to super boost my application, super boost my server, so that I don't need to do a lot of work for creating the responses. Right? If I look at the code here, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of it now, but it's genuinely pretty understandable in the terms of, I know that this here is a route, and I know that this here is another route, and I know that this here is yet another route, and they're all very separate. Whereas when I looked at the old code that I'd written, it was all merged together, right? That's the thing that I want you to understand. Yeah. Now, I want to end it by talking a little bit more about this middleware stuff kind of loosely. Middleware is anything that you snip into the middle of your request response pipeline. And you can create middleware on your own. You can go app.use. And here I can inject a function into the middle of my pipeline. And the way that this is going to work is it's going to have to say request, response, and next. I can console log the request if I wanted to, or I could do whatever. I'm just going to console log uh, yet, um, yet another request. And then the important thing is that at the end of your middleware, if you were to make your own, you would call next. Right? This is just the structure that the people who made Express decided on. Right? Is that you can give a callback to this use thing, do whatever you want, and then eventually call next. Yeah. Exactly. So this is going to be on every request to every route. If I was to run this and make a bunch of requests, so I'm just going to refresh this page a bunch of times. What I see in here is yet another request, yet another request, yet another request. That happens every time I make a request. And every time. What could I do you know, use this for is maybe I have um a count that starts at zero and I go uh, console.log count and then count plus plus to keep track of how many requests people have made. Right? So I have this variable to count the thing. Right, start at zero and then increase it every time. And then now every time I make requests, the number goes up. You know, maybe that's useful for you. Maybe every time you want to check to see if somebody's logged in, right? Maybe there's just some operation that you want to do every time, right? That could go in middleware. Here's another little bit of middleware called Morgan. Something that I did early, or like in the first half of the lecture, was I put console log statements to console log the request verb and the like the method and the URL to get some information there, because it's useful for me to see oh requests are coming in. So here's a little bit of middleware that lets you do exactly that. You can install this thing called Morgan. Install this thing called Morgan. So npm install morgan and then I can put it into my server and I can use it by going uh, do, 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 do. I'm looking for there's a couple configurations that you can use so I'm gonna do <coughs> app dot use app dot use morgan and I'm gonna say tiny it's just a configuration for the output of it you can see what kind of happens if I, I you know, well, we'll do combined first just so you see what it is. But now when I start my server, whoops, when I start my server, every time somebody makes a request, so I'm just going to refresh a bunch of times. Every time somebody makes a request, Morgan console logs a bunch of information. Cool. Just a little plugin I put in so that I get a console log every time, right? There's some configuration that you can look at on the docs, but if you set it to tiny, it only console logs a little bit of information. 
like that. A teeny little bit of info. Get which path, what status code, and how long did it take to process that request. Right. This can be useful for you when you're trying to track if you're making the request properly, what's going on in your project. Right. I'm not, I'm not saying you, oh sorry, I'm not saying you need to learn Morgan. I'm just trying to show you how streamlined the process is for grabbing a plugin and inserting it into your pipeline. Right. It was genuinely require and use. You had a question? Oh, uh, the variance of that time is going to be based on like my machine because my machine is the one responding to the thing. So it's it's going to be really low, but sort of random. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it might have cached responses or something. That's a good point. Twenty and then two. That's pretty funny. But um, yeah, that's that's actually interesting. I guess every time I do this now. It's going to stay low. I guess the very first request it makes, it needs to actually construct it, and then it caches the response, so it doesn't need to construct it again anymore. Um, did you have a question over there? I thought I saw your hand up. No? Cool. So this here, Express, right? Some closing thoughts are Express is really, really good for routing, and is really, really good for middleware. Right, routing and middleware, and part of that middleware might be the EJS stuff. And um, the notes that I'm going to send out, right, are going to have some resources that I really do want you to take some time to look at. Right, some stuff about what middleware is, how HTTP works, or the anatomy of those transactions, how to use EJS, right, and then particularly down here we're going like I've made little like a cheat sheet situation for some of the EJS stuff and also for some express stuff. Right. If you have any questions, please message me or come grab me. I generally sit over there. Right. I'm not mentoring today, but there's going to be a lot of mentors around to help you. Right. If you don't feel super comfortable with express today, that's okay. Right. This whole week is express. There's another lecture on express tomorrow. There's another lecture on Express on Thursday, right? So you're going to be fine. Sweet. Uh, are there any questions? Beautiful. Um, have a great rest of the day until until 3 o'clock when I, I have you again, right? <laughs> um, we're not going to do Express stuff at 3. We're going to do some like special JavaScript stuff. Cool. See you all.